So once our hazard analysis is completed, it's time to start making some plans to deal with the potential risk. This session will help you develop and implement plans to enhance the response capacity and resiliency in your business's human resources, physical facilities, primary mission essential functions, and your logistical and economic partners. In the last session, we took a good hard look at the difference between hazards and risk, and then we developed a model to assess and manage risks based on business priorities. If you remember, and as a quick review, the risk map has four sets of activities. Identifying and then assessing risk, communicating that risk, and finally mitigating the risk. Remember, the risk equation not only assesses the likelihood of a hazard being realized, it also considers the consequences of a potential incident. So now we're ready to look at what goes into the plan designed to mitigate the risk associated with the hazard and the risk assessment strategy, what we are calling the Business Continuity Plan, or BCP. Let's lay out some principles that situate business continuity planning in the context of major disasters and not necessarily the normal day-to-day -day business challenges. Disasters, and therefore major disruptions, are not the same as the day-to-day -day challenges that go along with running a business. While the feeling may be similar, there are practical differences between normal, day-to-day -day business challenges, challenges that you may not even notice as challenges, and the compound requirements of disaster resiliency. Also, the business continuity plan is not necessarily the goal. Business continuity is. Therefore, the plan is really never quite complete. In this way, business continuity plans are living documents requiring updating as the hazard environment or the magnitude of consequences change. And as we noted in the last session, there are many hazards that hold potential risk. If you were to chase down every hazard, you'd be left with dozens of plans and an unsustainable business continuity plan. Therefore, the business continuity plan takes an agent generic approach. It matters not whether high winds or high waters render your plant unusable. What does matter is that you have planned for the inevitable physical disruption due to severe weather emergencies. Plans must assume some level of unpredictability. It's often said good business continuity planning does not plan for what has happened, but for what could happen. And sometimes that takes a little imagination. You may be saving a vital piece of your business by including personnel with specialized skills or critical knowledge of certain business processes in the business continuity planning process. Business continuity planning must also focus on coordinating resources and functions. A rigid, static plan may get overrun by emerging, compounding conditions that are typical of the chaos brought on by major incidents. Therefore, general guidelines that allow for adaptability and flexibility are better than a rigid bureaucratic structure when resiliency and sustainability are the goals. Finally, business continuity planning is a collaborative endeavor, one that requires the input from representatives within and across organizations. One of the best ways to approach a comprehensive collaborative planning structure is to make a list of three to five partners that your business sees as priority organizations. This may be suppliers, clients, customers, or service providers. That list should be the first to approach when you get around to developing the business continuity plan. In summary, there are a couple key points to remember with business continuity planning. First, Planning for disasters and all of the potential consequences is a process. While a planning document is an artifact of successful planning, it is not the end-all, be-all. Secondly, the definition of what constitutes a comprehensive business continuity plan is on a sliding scale depending on business characteristics. For example, physical and economic size of the business, numbers of employees, geographic location, partnership profile, and numerous other individual business characteristics. 
In summary, there are a couple key points to remember with business continuity planning. First, planning for disasters and all of the potential consequences is a process. While a planning document is an artifact of successful planning, it is not the end-all, be-all. Secondly, the definition of what constitutes a comprehensive business continuity plan is on a sliding scale, depending on business characteristics. For example, physical and economic size of the business, numbers of employees, geographic location, partnership profile, and numerous other individual characteristics. And finally, as we'll see in the next few minutes, the business continuity plan is actually a set of more specific plans to deal with emergencies with the goal of adding business resilience. Answer the following question before proceeding. The answer is false. Disaster planning is not the same as routine business planning and requires the input of many business stakeholders. Once the hazard profile is completed and a planning team is assembled, it is important to conduct a business impact analysis to determine as accurately as possible the consequence factors in the risk management equation. The business impact analysis, or BIA, helps leadership justify the risk management strategy that is selected, as well as justifying the resource investment to implement the strategy. A BIA identifies the most important areas of the business the things that have to be done to get back up and running as soon as possible after a business disruption. We referred to these earlier as primary mission essential functions. The BIA also estimates the potential loss due to downtime or other disruptions while also identifying acceptable losses. The BIA outlines steps towards recovery and provides a time frame with benchmarks toward continuity of operations. And finally, the BIA is also used to identify important recovery documentation, some of which may be required by insurance companies or the federal government when applying for disaster recovery assistance. There are several justifications for conducting a business impact analysis, but especially to ensure the health and well-being of employees and patrons alike. There's a financial benefit as well especially since no business has unlimited resources and resource efficiency is a universal business goal. Other businesses have a legal requirement to conduct a business impact analysis. And finally, a business impact analysis may lead to more effectiveness and efficiency during normal business operations. So what is the BIA? It examines the risk and assesses the impact a particular occurrence could have on business continuity. It is the consequence factor in the risk equation. It is meant to provide a return on the investment into the risk management program by mitigating the risk and minimizing downtime. So how do you conduct a business impact analysis? Well, you first identify the financial and non-financial cost of a disaster. Financial costs are pretty well understood. But the non-financial costs, for example, loss of employees, suppliers, or customers, that may take a little time. Then it is important to establish an expected reasonable recovery period. Obviously, everyone desires zero downtime, but is that a realistic goal for some incidents? Therefore, establishing an acceptable recovery period based on the disruptive agent is a necessary component of the BIA. It is important to identify the critical materials and records, as well as necessary resources, that will sustain your primary mission essential functions. This may be as simple as a working computer, an internet connection for some businesses, but can be very complicated for large manufacturing plants. And finally, make a preliminary assessment of what potential resources are necessary to get the business back up and running to normal operational capacity. The business impact analysis must include logistical considerations to support the primary mission essential functions, what depends on them and what they depend on, and 
how long the business can survive without those dependencies being met. In other words, the business impact analysis follows a typical logic model of inputs, processes, and outputs. Determine what goes into the primary mission essential functions. What needs to happen to produce the primary mission essential functions? And finally, how those primary mission essential functions are delivered. This process will identify critical needs and systems that must be maintained with redundancies or other sustainable strategies to minimize downtime and ensure business continuity. Answer the following question before proceeding. The answer is E, all of the above. The BIA identifies the most important areas of the business. It also estimates the potential loss due to downtime or other disruptions, as well as identifying acceptable losses. The BIA also outlines steps towards recovery and provides a time frame with benchmarks toward continuity of operations. And the BIA also is used to identify important recovery documentations as well, some of which may be required by insurance companies or the federal government when applying for disaster recovery assistance. Answer the following question before proceeding. The answer is true. The BIA follows a typical logic model of inputs, processes, and outputs. First, you determine what goes into the primary mission essential functions, what needs to happen to produce those primary mission essential functions, and finally, how those primary mission essential functions are delivered. This process will identify critical needs and systems that must be maintained with redundancies or other sustainable strategies to minimize downtime and ensure business continuity. We're going to conclude this session by looking at the business continuity plan in a much more technical light by explaining a rudimentary business continuity plan, what a simple plan looks like, and how you may adapt this model to meet your specific company's needs. No matter how big or small your company is, the business continuity plan will contain a couple key elements. It should be obvious by now that not all business continuity plans are the same but they are all based on the same risk equation we discussed in the first session. This model may be adapted based on the size and configuration of your business. First, the business continuity plan contains a hazard analysis and threat profile, or THIRA, which stands for Threat and Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment. This is the likelihood portion of the risk management equation we discussed in session one. Secondly, the business continuity plan also contains the business impact analysis, a section that explains the consequences factor in the risk management equation. The business continuity plan also contains an emergency operations plan, or EOP, what activates it, who and what implements it, and how it is demobilized. And then finally, the business continuity plan also contains an Incident Action Plan, or IAP, which is how we handle daily emergencies at our location and what constitutes an emergency that requires the activation of the EOP. So as noted, THIRA stands for Threat and Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment. It is the detailed account of the threat posed by the risk that was identified in the Hazard Assessment Exercise. The THIRA gives threat a realistic context, both the probability and the consequences. It also helps determine what the impacts of those threats are and how they may be managed in the risk management program. THIRA leads to a competency-based response to an incident by matching the desired outcomes to the development of core business competencies. As also noted earlier, the BIA, or Business Impact Analysis, identifies the operational and financial impacts resulting from the disruption of business functions and processes, including lost or delayed sales and income, increased expenses due to emergency response, regulatory fines, which may occur in some sectors of the economy, 
contractual penalties or loss of expected contractual performance bonuses, customer dissatisfaction or defection of customers, and delay of new business plans. The functional annexes in the business continuity plan are more specifically designed to address the decision-making challenges associated with responding to emergencies. The EOP, or Emergency Operations Plan, and the Incident Action Plan, or IAP, deal with the risks that have the highest probability or the greatest set of consequences. Examples include annexes outlining crisis communication procedures, or how the company plans on dealing with weather emergencies that occur during business hours. Other examples include technological disruptions, like utilities or information management systems. Another emerging issue is the threat associated with active shooters, or those with other criminal intentions impacting the business. At this point, there may be some confusion as to which plans are which. This model is derived from the Community Planning Guide 101, where the levels of planning are modeled after a pyramid. At the base of the pyramid are the tactical plans, those that address emergency incidents and the demands those incidents place on responders. In this case, company personnel with the requisite authority, training, and resources. In the middle are the operational plans that include the overall emergency operations plans, those areas that equip the incident action plans. An example here is the development of a training program to address deficiencies in response capacity. Operational plans make the critical connection between strategic goals and tactical objectives. At the very top of the pyramid are the strategic areas that need to be addressed to ensure coherence throughout the incident management system. Here is where the policy actors develop company-wide policies and procedures to address the business continuity program. The EOP, or Emergency Operations Plan, and therefore the IAP, Incident Action Plan, require the actions of trained and prepared personnel. Minimal emergency training can be scheduled throughout the business cycle to develop trainers, responders, liaisons, or other critical actors needed during times of emergency. Consult the FEMA Emergency Management Institute website for free online courses to develop an understanding of the National Incident Management System, or NIMS, and the Nationally Accepted Incident Command System, or ICS. The EOP also addresses the facility that houses the business. While securing the primary and secondary facilities is a vital part of business continuity, other equally important components of the Emergency Operations Plan include securing capital resources, vital records and technology, and information processing systems. Typically, we assume our primary and secondary facilities have several interrelated engineered systems to protect against and control emergencies. Among the more prevalent are the fire detection, notification, and suppression systems of fire-resistive construction, called controlling parameters. The engineered systems include many structural elements as well, called physical parameters. However, is that a safe assumption, given multiple owners or the potential for renovations to in some way alter the ability of the physical or controlling elements to function the way they were originally designed? The third category that the EOP IAP must address are the critical processes that keep the business moving forward. These are the mission essential functions of the company and can be assessed by analyzing where they occur who has the special knowledge, skills, or abilities to accomplish these functions, any information technology that is necessary for the functions, and any other automatic or manual systems that support their accomplishment. Once these answers are developed, the EOP builds redundant systems to maintain the primary mission essential functions that produce continuity. This may be as easy as buying a backup generator, and maintaining an emergency fuel supply, or perhaps stockpiling critical supplies 
that will fill the void experienced by temporary logistical disruptions. Finally, very few businesses operate in a vacuum. Therefore, the business continuity plan must address the key partners that will facilitate resilience during business disruptions. Most businesses recognize the power and other utility companies as vital partners, but that list is entirely too limited. Other potential partners include material suppliers, transportation companies, clients and customers, as well as perhaps competitors in the same business sector. It is also important to note here that the public governance sector relies on business resilience for overall community recovery. So don't leave your government partners out of the plan where it's appropriate. In this session, we looked at the foundation for and development of the business continuity plan. After creating a hazard profile through the risk management program, planning for emergencies and business disruptions is a detailed and comprehensive activity, not the same as planning for routine emergencies. The business impact analysis or BIA follows a typical logic model of inputs, processes, and outputs. Business continuity planning is actually a set of individual plans that include that hazard analysis, the Thyra or Threat and Hazard Identification Risk Assessment, the Emergency Operations Plan, and the Incident Action Plan. Comprehensive business continuity plans include enhancing response capacity in the company's people, plant, processes, and partners.